Okay, we are back online. This is, it is still Tuesday, February 22nd, and this is still government operations, Senate government operations. And we are looking today at a bill that is uh, S-251. It's about divestiture from fossil fuel, divestiture of our uh, pension funds from fossil fuels. And we have with us today, Richard Brooks from Stand Earth. Um, and we're going to, he, uh, Mr. Brooks has a bit of a time constraint. So we're going to let him kick off and then we're gonna hear from the treasurer because she didn't get a chance in our last meeting to weigh in on this. And what I'm gonna do first, um, Mr. Brooks, you're not usually with us. So I'm gonna have us introduce ourselves and then we'll just jump to you. So I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. Hi, I'm Anthony Polina from Washington County. Ryan Collimore from Rutland County. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County. Aisha Ramhin, Still Chittenden County, and Richard, thanks so much for coming on very short notice and being prepared to be here. We appreciate it. Great to have you. So thank you. So if you want to just jump in and talk to us about um, your experience and give us lots of information, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for uh, thanks for putting me at the top of the agenda. I appreciate that. Um, and it's nice to meet you all, uh, Senators and Treasurer. Um, I'll just tell you a quick bit about myself and then I'll uh, dive into the issue of, of the day. Um, so uh, my name is Richard Brooks. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm based in Toronto, Canada. Grew up in Montreal, though, and spent quite a bit of time in Vermont. So I appreciate uh, the great green state. Um, and um, my background's uh, working on environmental issues for a couple of decades, uh, mostly on forest and climate issues. Uh, in the last few years, I've been working on climate finance um, and working on uh, supporting um, advocates to um, work with their pension funds, usually public pension funds, to move out of fossil fuels and to uh, increase investments in uh, climate solutions and had a, quite a bit of success uh, doing so in a number of different states, which I'll talk a little bit about um, during my, I guess, my testimony. Um, again, thank you for the time. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to say that divestment should really be looked at as a responsible fiduciary act. Um, this isn't so much, a, from my standpoint, uh, about climate leadership or taking action on climate change. Uh, first and foremost, as fiduciaries, um, your, your primary responsibility is to act in a fiduciarily sound way. Um, we know that divestment is legally sound. We know that it's fiduciary right, fiduciarily right, and it's no longer novel. Um, you know, this is not a new issue. This is not, uh, I don't think um, senators and advocates are asking you to take a step that no other pension fund has taken before. We have now more than 1,500 institutions with assets over $40 trillion who have made some form of commitment to divestment uh, from fossil fuels. And these include very large mainstream banks, insurance companies, and increasingly pension funds. New York State, New York City, Washington, DC, Baltimore, Maine, Minnesota, San Mateo County in California, Los Angeles, are all US examples of pension funds who have moved forward with pursuing divestment. So this is, this is becoming the mainstream um, and they've broken the ground already. Uh, and I think it's really up to Vermont to, to step in and follow in their footsteps. They've done all the legal and financial checks uh, to make sure that divestment uh, is sound. And most of these funds are bigger than Vermont's fund. All share in common with Vermont a requirement to ensure that the fund remains sound. And all have concluded that phasing out investments in fossil fuels is one of the ways to do so. Uh, many have coupled this with setting goals and commitments to increase investments in climate solutions at the same time, including uh, investments in community-based initiatives that can net a return for the fund while also advancing solutions in their own ju jurisdiction or nationally or internationally. Just two weeks ago, you may, you may have seen um, that um, the New York State uh, uh, Comptroller announced that he was going to be moving the Common Retirement Fund, that's the state pension fund, out of investments in 22 shale oil and gas companies. And that amounted to about $320 million 
that they were going to move out of those companies. At the time, uh, Comptroller de Napoli said, I quote, as market forces and new policies drive the energy transition, we must align our investments with a profitable and dynamic future. The shale oil and gas industry faces numerous obstacles going forward that pose risks to its financial performance. To protect the state pension fund, we are restricting investments in companies that we believe are unprepared to adapt to a low carbon future, end quote. So that is a very clear and simple statement that I think speaks volumes about the approach that Vermont should be taking in regards to investments in fossil fuels. If you believe that fossil fuel companies need to be engaged and pressured to change their business practices, then you are implicitly admitting that their business models as they currently stand are inherently out of line with climate science and the direction of policy and regulation. You are admitting they are financially risky by saying we need to engage fossil fuel companies to change their business practices. If their business practices were sound, you wouldn't be wanting to engage those companies. There would be no reason to engage those companies. Um, so I think, I think that speaks to the, the, the issue of having a seat at the table. Why would you as a shareholder be concerned about their viability if it wasn't, if they didn't present a risk to the pension fund? And your foremost duty is to de-risk and enhance returns for your pensioners and for the taxpayers of Vermont. There's no energy, econom energy econ economics uh, worth their salt who hasn't confirmed that we are entering a period of rap rapid transition of global energy systems that favor renewables and that the outlook for oil, the oil and gas sector looks increasingly dim. There's an increasing risk of stranded assets. And we're seeing right now, present day, the, that global geopolitics are not favoring coal, oil, and gas right now. Part of the reason why we're having an energy crisis in Europe and in Southeast Asia is because of geopolitics. When you have renewables, there is no fuel that has to be transported around the, the globe. It's the wind and the sun and the tides that you rely upon. And those are controlled in your own backyard. Um, they aren't subject to the winds of geopolitics. So if only for that reason, um, we should be getting out of fossil fuels. That, that's a real clear signal to fiduciaries. Seen differently though, um, and I, you know, I do want to, to, to note that there are, you know, uh, there are pension funds, there are investment boards who do want to remain invested in fossil fuels. So they have this seat at the table so they can try their hand at engaging fossil fuel companies. There's nothing limiting a fund from remaining invested with a number of shares in a fossil fuel company, which gives them a seat at the table that allows your voice to be heard and you can continue to attempt to talk to oil and gas companies into changing. This doesn't require- Anthony, you, can you take over for a minute? Sure. This, does, this doesn't require you to have hundreds of millions of dollars invested in those fossil fuel companies. You can have a seat at the table with hundred shares. You don't need 10,000 shares to do so. Effectively, you can have your cake and eat it too while you try that approach. That being said though, there is no track record that I'm aware of of, a, of successful engagement with fossil fuel companies despite shareholders doing this for more than two, two decades. In the past year, many institutional shareholders have pointed to the Exxon director vote as a sign of success of the shareholder engagement approach. In that, in that case, three independent directors were elected to the board of Exxon over the wishes of management. Um, with promises to reform and change the company, to change the direction of the company after years of failed engagement by shareholders. But we're now eight months into the tenure of those new directors, and there's been little change. In fact, there's been quite a few reports that Exxon continues to expand greenfield expansion of new fossil fuel infrastructure, including in places like Guyana over the rights of local communities in the Permian Basin, one of the largest source points of methane emissions in the US. And recently the CIO, the chief investment officer of CalSTRS, which as you may know, is the second largest pension fund in the country, recently voiced his disappointment and frustration with Exxon, who he said was at risk of going the way of Blockbuster and Kodak. This is, you know, CalSTRS was one of the pension funds which led the push to get new directors on the board of Exxon. And they are admitting that the company is not changing despite that pretty monumental um, uh, victory, um, quote unquote, 
for shareholders. I think that's a reason enough to focus on other ways of addressing the climate crisis and de-risking the pension fund in Vermont. So I think you find yourself at a key moment where the economics of the industry are clearly declining in the long term, which is your investment horizon. It's not the short term, it's the long term. And when climate science has never been clearer, when the impacts of fossil fuel companies on frontline and racialized communities is well known and well documented, and importantly, when you have viable investable alternatives that already exist. Uh, other pension funds have broken the, the ground, as I've already stated, and it's really, I think, time for Vermont to follow in those footsteps and, and claim the climate leadership that you want to set for yourselves as well. Um, passing this bill is the way to do that, and uh, I'm, and I, I guess that concludes my testimony. I'm happy to take any questions and speak to my experience in, in states like New York. Thank so you. Committee, anybody have any questions? Yes, Senator Polina. Hi, I, one is a quick one, and then the other one might be a little bit longer, but, um, you know, the fiduciary responsibility means that funds are supposed to make money. So is there, is it too early to tell whether or not fossil, fossil fuel free funds are going to outperform or perform as good as regular funds? Or can we, do we see them performing better or worse? Is it too early to tell? I'm just wondering sort of what your take is on that. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, if you look at the performance of the S&P 500, uh, including fossil fuel companies versus the S&P 500, excluding fossil fuel companies. You go back one year, three years, five years, 10 years. Uh, in all cases, uh, the S&P 500 uh, without fossil fuel companies has outperformed the S&P 500. And that's looking backwards. Now, looking forward, we know the look, you can't always, you can't base future returns based on the past. I think that answers half of your question. Looking forward, based on what the International Energy Agency is saying, we don't need more fossil fuel expansion. We need to accelerate the transition to renewables. The companies that are going to benefit from that transition are renewables companies uh, and, the, and, the, and the energy companies that are transitioning. Uh, most of the oil and gas sector is not transitioning fast enough, and they're going to get left behind. We have seen a... a uh, uh, share price increase and bond price increase in the last year uh, with oil and gas companies and many uh, folks who I think you know aren't supportive of divestment will point to those returns and say well if you had divested a year ago then you wouldn't be able to benefit from this uh, spike in in share prices for oil and gas companies but that's a temporary spike um, I think you know it's important to uh, remember that the uh, the investment horizon for pension funds is 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It's not year to year. So you look 30 years into the future and you think about what the energy systems are going to look like in 30 years time. And it's not going to be based on oil and gas. I mean, all the science is saying that if it is based on oil and gas, then we have a much bigger problem. The problem being that we are at risk of uh, the, the, the chaos caused by climate change. It seems, I mean, if I could just follow, it seems that a lot of organizations, entities have divested. I'm wondering if, the, I'm sure there's hesitancy amongst a lot of these folks to begin with, and they see challenges in, do, in, do, in divesting. I'm wondering, isn't there at this point sort of like a playbook that we could follow, you know, based on the New York example, perhaps? I mean, you know, where we could sort of have a sense of direction and how to go about divesting in a way that is going to be, you know, good for us? Absolutely. I, I, I think that should give you comfort um, that there are others who have done it. As I said, there are much larger pension funds who have done it and have done it in a legally sound way, in a fiduciary sound way. They do have playbooks. Um, and some of those funds are, are open to sharing and advising on that. And I would definitely counsel reaching out to New York State and New York City to understand what processes they led um, or they went through and what kind of consultants and experts they uh, attained or retained to advise them on their divestment plans. Um, New York City, for example, hired Makita and BlackRock. Uh, you know, BlackRock is no you know, radical um, lefty uh, organization. They are the world's largest asset manager with trillions of dollars of assets under management. They advised that there would be no negative impact for New York City to pursue divestment and outlined an approach that they could take. 
uh, that was sound and responsible. And they followed through on that approach and now have divested $3 billion from fossil fuel companies. So oh, I have a follow-up to that and then I'll go to Senator Clarkson. But um, I know that we talked about this the last time we had this here, that this, this bill does not follow the New York model at all. And so my question is, if we pass this bill, we're not following the New York model. And um, so I guess my question is, how do we, if we wanna follow the New York model, we have to change this bill. So we can't just pass this bill because then it doesn't do that. So I guess my question is, you advised us to just pass this bill but on the other hand, we're looking at making some changes. And I think we heard last time that there was interest in looking at the New York model and how that might be implemented here. So, and the other question I have is in terms of timing, this bill is very aggressive in terms of timing. And the other question I have is tying it to this particular list, which I understand is a uh, um, what's the word I want to use? It's a for-profit, um, it's a private list. The, so I have those three questions about, do we, do we pass this bill as it is, or do we look at making changes that would allow us to do more of what New York did? Yeah, uh, I, I think this is an area where I, I mean, it's more up to you than up to me around this. Um, my advice would be, you know, create, you know, craft it. If, if, if the bill works for Vermont, then I think that's the bill that you should pass. That being said, I think gathering advice from others, including New York State and, and New York City, uh, Maine, uh, Baltimore, uh, is, is a responsible approach. I, I don't think it hurts to have uh, their direct expert opinion on how they've uh, pursued things and what kind of steps they had to go through, uh, what kind of roadblocks they reached and how they went around them. Um, you know, Most of the pension funds are managed in very similar ways, but they are unique as well. Um, and uh, I think having more advice rather than less is always helpful. Um, and then I think making an informed decision about whether there should be modifications to bill based on that, uh, I think would make sense. In terms of um, the, I think the proprietary nature, I think you're referring to the carbon underground 200 list, is that? Yeah, yeah. I think that's what I'm referring to. Yeah, so the carbon underground 200 list is a, is a common, it's, it's been a commonly used, um, I guess, list of companies. Um, that helps uh, pension funds and investment boards designate um, their divestment asks to those companies that are very likely most at risk from uh, the transition to renewables uh, because they hold the largest reserves on the planet. And baked into their share and bond price is the value of those reserves. Those reserves, because many of them will not get export and not get developed, um, are at risk, and they are the ones that will likely suffer the largest economic impacts from uh, a rapid transition uh, to the renewable sector. So uh, the fact that it's a priority list that uh, fossil fuel, um, I think they're called fossil free investment solutions now offers, I don't think that should give you too much pause, um, again, because it's been uh, commonly used by other states and cities uh, so far in the implementation of their divestment plans. Thank you. Senator Clarkson. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm hoping that we can redraft this and incorporate uh, the aspects of the New York model. I, I have two questions for you. Um, one is the argument for staying in is sort of the Calster's argument, which is if you're in, you have a seat at the table. Now we're a pretty tiny seat at the table. I mean, of the three bears, you know, we're the tiniest little bear. And uh, we have a pretty, you know, our pension funds are pretty modest compared to some of the others here. Um, how do you respond to that argument? Because clearly Calster's is profoundly disappointed by 
Exxon, its new board members and what it's done. So I, that's question number one, because that's the argument that our treasurer and uh, has generally put forward is that we should stay in because we can affect policy. And the second thing I want to ask you about is the risk, because to me, the risk of the world about to sue the bejesus out of the fossil fuel industry for what it's done to our world and the impact of what we have to spend to clean up our world, that those lawsuits haven't even begun. So to me, every one of our fossil fuel investments is under you know, potentially huge risk of being worth almost nothing. So it's not, it's a stranded asset that is, you know, a huge, could be a huge liability in not so distant a future. So those are my two questions for you. Uh, yeah, I think on the first question, uh, again, I, I think you said it better than I did. Uh, you, you have a very small seat at the table. Um, but more importantly, um, you know, when you look at the track record of um, institutional shareholders who have focused their shareholder energy on uh, fossil fuel companies, which, where, where you're trying to get them to change their core business, not some ancillary aspect of their business, but the core business, um, there isn't a track record of success anywhere in the world. So you don't have fossil fuel companies that I can point to who's, who have heard from shareholders. And as a result, from hearing from shareholders, they've switched to being renewable companies. Um, that doesn't exist anywhere. With companies where it, your shareholders are exercising or you know, flexing their muscles on an issue that's not a core business. So how many women are on the board of uh, X company? Or what's the, uh, what's the diversity of the senior management team at another company? Or reporting on uh, human rights issues related to some aspect of their supply chain. Those shareholder resolutions and that type of shareholder engagement does have a track record of success. Um, and I think that's a place to focus your energy, especially as you have limited staff resources to engage companies. I would focus on the sectors where you can achieve real change through shareholder engagement and not waste your energy on companies that are, are fundamentally are not, you cannot change them. Um, they will go the ways of dinosaurs. Some of them may succeed, but that's not a bet that I would make uh, with taxpayer money. Um, I think that's something that you can do, you know, uh, on the side, but definitely don't do it with taxpayer money, especially in the in the case of a, a pension fund, which you know you need to make sure is in, is 100% uh, funded for your taxpayers. Um, and the second question around uh, risk of stranded assets and uh, companies being sued, there 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 are now currently dozens and dozens of uh, climate related lawsuits against fossil fuel companies in, in the United States as well as around the world. Um, very similar to what we saw with tobacco companies several decades ago. Uh, tobacco companies also face their own divestment movement. And the reason for that divestment movement was to reduce the power of tobacco companies, particularly around political lobbying. Um, right now, there isn't a, a government in the country where tobacco companies are welcome at the lobby table. And that's a result of the divestment movement and because of those big lawsuits. I think we're facing the same thing um, with fossil fuel companies. And those lawsuits are going too soon. You know, it might be another five, 10, 15 years. They are soon going to cost those companies lots of money. They're already costing those companies a decent amount of money in terms of legal fees. It's going to cost them lots of money when it comes to damages uh, as, as it will come out. And again, just a reminder, you are investing for the long term. You're investing for the next 30, 40, 50 years. It's not about the next year or two. Um, and so that risk is just going to escalate. The best time to get out of fossil fuels is probably about 10 years ago. The next yeah. best time is right now because you actually have a bump in share prices. And so it's time to sell when it's high because it, it's not going to stay high like this. And I'm, you know, I'm not an economist. This is not my... Uh, it's not my, uh, my, my area of study, but ask, ask any economist, and I'm sure they will tell you that the, the outlook for these companies is, is growing dimmer by the day. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes, Senator uh, Rom Hinsdale. 
I don't know if this is, is what you're referring to, Richard. It's it's sad to think there is a bump in share prices today, as I understand it, because of the um, the lack of certification from Germany of the new natural gas pipeline from Russia. Um, so it just goes to show it's really interconnected to global conflict, um, how yeah. we are pulling fossil fuels out of the ground. You can comment on that, but that wasn't my question. My question was just, we had started, and thank you for coming in on very short notice and answering so many of our questions. Um, you you had talked about working with the New York State Comptroller's Office, and we had started to talk about who we might bring in. I didn't know if you wanted to add any color or nuance to, to who we might bring in from uh, New York and who you've worked with most closely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think definitely um, happy to put you in touch um, with the uh, New York State Comptroller directly. Um, and uh, you can speak to him. Um, his um, director of corporate governance, Liz Gordon, is, a, is, is great. Wow. She has a lot of experience in shareholder engagement uh, and is implementing the uh, de-risking and divestment plan that the Comptroller has laid out. At the New York City level, there are several great people in the New York City Comptroller's Office. There's a new Comptroller in place, um, but he is committed to continue to implement the plan that was put in place by the previous Comptroller. And they were the ones who, as I, as I mentioned, hired Makita and BlackRock to advise them on the implementation right. of their divestment plan. So, and those, and those reports are actually publicly available. I'm happy to share those um, after we get off this chat or this testimony. Um, because those would be great documents for you to take a look at as well. So if you could send that information to Gail Kerrigan, then mm -hmm. we will uh, contact them and see see who we need to have testify. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Okay, I am. thank you so much for joining us and um, my apologies for the delayed invite that was my, my bad and I take responsibility for it. So. Thank you for um, joining us. And with that, and we're you're certainly welcome to stay. And I know that you asked in your um, email to um, be hooked up with the with our treasure because there were some things that you thought that could be done outside of legislation. And um, so there there is our treasure right there, and her. Um, Email is beth.pierce at vermont.gov. And she so, is right there. <laughs> yes. Uh, P-E-A-R-C-E. -E. No one ever spells it correctly. Right. P-E-A-R-C-E -E at vermont.gov. And so there you've made the contact and we'll see where we go from there. So thank you. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate your time. Uh, <laughs> Treasurer Pierce, I will reach out to you to talk about banks and um, some upcoming climate related resolutions, which I'm sure you're already aware of. We, we'd love yep. to talk and um, I um, prefer Beth over Treasurer Pierce. So call me Beth, please. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Richard. Give, give our best to Toronto. I will. <laughs> Thank you. Lots Take of Clarkson's up there. So um, we're going to uh, the, Beth did not get a chance to weigh in last time we talked about this because we got cut short on time. So we're going to give time to Beth right now to do this. And I'm going to say that um, at four o'clock, I have to jump to a, a chairs meeting and I'm going to ask Anthony to take over. So thank you. Okay, Beth, go ahead. Sure, if I can take one minute, uh, my, my computer blacked out on one screen, I'm over here and this, if I look distracted, this, uh, this particular setup is a little distracting. So I'm gonna see if I can do something a little different so that I'm not, uh, um, is that any better? I don't think so. Nope, I'm going back right over here. It's I fine, we're all one. used to uh, standing right. on our heads and. Now I've made it worse. No, we want to see your face, though. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'm going to let someone else try to fix this for me. Give me one second. I'm great at technology. Can you tell? Yeah, me too. Well, at least she has helpers. <laughs> there you go. I think we're going to have to stick a piece of gum on Thank that. Thank you. 
right place. There we go. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to ask you a favor in the process. You know, what, I'm trying to get through a lot of material and there are going to be questions. I'd like you to kind of hold your questions so that we can deal with them in groups uh, so that we really can get through. There needs to be some kind of continuity to, to this. And I would appreciate that, that opportunity. So, so I did send a PowerPoint. I don't know if everyone has it or whether we need to put it up on the screen. I think Which we have question? access to it. It's posted okay. on our website. All right. So I'm going to go through, um, there's a lot of pages. I will try to skip through a lot of them, but um, basically in the summary uh, that um, uh, I am chair of the, um, uh, the ESG committee uh, for VPIT, the Vermont Pension Investment Commission. And uh, we had a meeting on February 4th to review S251. And the committee has a strong commitment to addressing climate change. And I'll get through some of that in, in a bit. Um, but we think that, um, that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that this particular bill um, it, um, is contrary to the, co the completed studies we've had for VPIC and uh, we, we're not in support of it. Um, we would argue that divestment does not reduce fossil fuel emissions, but rather abdicates our voice in affecting positive change. Engagement with companies has proven to be effective and I'll talk about some of those efforts. And VPEC has engaged on a number of issues, including climate change with pos um, positive results. And we'll talk about that in a bit as well. Um, in 2017, we engaged a pension advisor um, to, uh, and it was selected by the environmental community uh, to study divestment. Uh, what we heard was that divestment increases costs and creates additional um, um, uh, risk to the portfolio. Uh, we exercise our, our fiduciary responsibilities by doing that. And while divestment was not considered feasible, our consultant, which was Pension Consulting Alliance, did make recommendations on steps to address climate change. VPIC adopted an action plan based on that, and we've made progress on each component. Tom talked to you the other day about working and retooling our, um, our carbon reduction policy. And I think that that's um, um, a direction that we want to go in, and uh, it's consistent with the, the concerns and the direction that VPIC has um, made uh, in terms of steps on climate change. Um, any discussion of divestment should be preceded by an independent study. And I believe that anything less is an abrogation of our fiduciary responsibilities. When uh, Mr. Brooks was talking, I, I, I took note of some things. He said they did all the legal checks. They looked to make sure it was sound. Uh, they, they had uh, Makita and BlackRock take a look at it. Um, you don't make decisions about investments without going through a process uh, that, uh, that um, uh, is consistent with our fiduciary responsibility. There are two stages to this, and that's on page, um, I, it would be helpful if I actually put pages on this, I guess it's four, um, that there are two stages to this. One is what we call procedural prudence, and that's a process by which a fiduciary reaches a decision, and substantive prudence is the outcome of that process. And fiduciary duties have a responsibility to both. You make a, an adequate investigation, but then you make a decision based on that, um, uh, that um, investigation. Right now, the studies that are out there, um, which were one done by our staff, uh, one done by an independent um, uh, uh, advisor, and a third done by um, PCA, which was um, uh, a, a, an investment advisory firm that was picked out of a group of three that were provided by members of the environmental community, all pointed to the fact that divestment was not appropriate for our portfolio. And I want to stress that I am not making a comment on divestment in general. I am making a comment specific to the due diligence that we've made. Um, and I'm more than happy to have another study and another process. And to say that we don't need studies, we have to move on. Part of our fiduciary responsibility is to make sound judgment based on facts. And I think that uh, given what um, uh, Mr. Brooks just said, I think he would agree with that. We need to have a process in place to, uh, to make sure that what we're doing is correct. And I would welcome that type of process. Um, the PCA study was a great example of a procedural and substantive prudence in action. And uh, any course change that we are going to make or will contemplate making uh, should be done uh, with, with the same type of prudence that we had the last time. Um, with respect to the uh, committee uh, supports um, alternatives that were prevented, uh, presented by uh, VPIC Chair Tom Galancos at this meeting today in his presentation. Uh, and I'll just mention those quickly. Uh, VPIC carbon uh, policy um, 
um, uh, should be vetted by the ESG committee, but we are looking at that. Expanded engagement activities, identifying priorities to target. Uh, three, collaboration with pension oversight, joint committees, pension boards, the legislature, and interested parties. We see this as a collaborative approach. And if you have time, I would uh, recommend you take a look, listen to the audio uh, versions of all the meetings we had back in 16 and 17, including um, uh, four presentations uh, on fiduciary responsibility, two by investment, uh, excuse me, environmental advocates, two by um, councils to pension funds. We had a very clear open exchange. I think you'd find that that was a, um, a, um, a very fruitful process for all of us. Um, active interview um, in, uh, with divestment positions when engagement fails and creation of a study group to review the uh, 2007 recommendations. Uh, we are engaged in, in social uh, economic, excuse me, environmental, social and governance, the ESG policies. Uh, we see that ESG is all about making uh, the uh, decisions uh, that uh, the board has. It's integrated into our, uh, our investment policies. Um, there are some materials on page eight. I won't go through all those. Uh, our proxy policies, our shareholder resolution information, um, our ESG policy, and I have included, um, um, uh, I guess the term is um, links to the, uh, to the various reports that you can find on our, on our, um, on our site, as well as the new VPIC commission uh, site. And I would strongly urge you to, uh, to take a look at those. Uh, VPIC engagement does make a difference. Um, and I think that I, when I heard someone say tiny bear, um, I think that was you, Senator Clarkson. Um, we might be a tiny bear, but when we get together with all those other bears, we make a loud noise. And uh, VPIC does shareholder engagement as an effective means to vote it's, as an institutional investor, but we work with larger groups. We were a founding member of a group called INCR, Investment Network for Climate Risk. That time there were 11 states involved, uh, Vermont being one of them. Uh, now that group, uh, which is run through series, has, has trillions of assets that are, that are um, in, in that fund. And, and the leverage that we have to make change is by virtue of that, that, um, uh, those dollars. You know, there was a comment that we could only keep a small amount um, in certain um, investments to make a, a change. It's the power of those collective dollars that makes a difference when we go to the boardroom and to get the votes that we need. And we've been able to work with other institutional investors to do this in combination uh, with um, other, other groups as well. And uh, there's a list in our, my presentation of the various affiliations we have um, to, to address that. Um, I'm gonna point out something that it, uh, it's on page nine of the presentation uh, that our engagement allows us to join with other larger, larger institutional investors. And there's a, um, there's a quote in here from um, uh, David Sirota in a book called The Uprising, an unauthorized tour of the populist revolt, uh, scaring Wall Street and Washington. I used to have three copies of that book um, because I loved it so much and I gave it to everyone to read. Unfortunately, no one returned them, so I'm now in need of another copy. But uh, I'd just like to read a quote from then. Then again, the enormous size that makes multinational companies like ExxonMobil seem so immovable is precisely why these seemingly minute victories are actually huge. If you, if you get a giant corporation with global reach to change even a tiny bit, you have made a global impact. So I guess that goes back to those tiny bears once again. Um, on page 10 of the presentation, we talked a little bit about some of our shareholder results. And uh, uh, we did do a, um, uh, a um, uh, an engagement with Hess Corporation, uh, along with the Minnesota State Investment Board. We filed a shareholder resolution to encourage the company to reduce its impact on climate change. Uh, we ended up um, uh, pulling that, uh, that uh, uh, resolution because we had success. Uh, we, uh, uh, in a eight, uh, an SEC 8K uh, filing, they agreed to link executive pay incentives to a flaring reduction target. There's nothing more uh, useful than in linking your salary to, uh, to, um, to um, expectations and objectives. And uh, we think that that's a very important tool. The company announced its plans to eliminate routine flaring by 2025 and endorsed the World Bank's zero routine uh, uh, flaring by 2030 initiatives. Now, we know that companies make com uh, 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 efforts and then there's a little lag here and there. We're continuing to work with these companies 
there is no perfect answer to all of this, but we are uh, clearly involved in that. Um, if you go to page 11, uh, the ExxonMobil uh, 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 presentation that we have here, and I know, um, uh, Mr. Brooks, you uh, talked about, uh, if I let you call me Beth, I hope you, I can call you Richard here. So Richard, we did um, take a look at this, and we see this is groundbreaking. Um, it was backed by an investor, um, um, a, a, a small private equity firm called Engine Number no. One. I refer to them as the uh, little engine that could. And uh, we, there were contested board elections. And for the first time, I believe, in the history of Exxon, um, um, they, uh, uh, they uh, uh, ousted three members of management into that 12-member board. And yes, it's been eight months, but eight months in a process is, is just the beginning. And having them and, and continuing to do this work and to continuing to to um, uh, address these and keeping the pressure on Exxon, I you know I asked uh, I had a great conversation to, uh, about a dozen treasurers and I met with uh, Engine Number One to discuss the results, what happened, how did you pick Exxon and, and the like, and the bottom line for me was that. Um, that they saw this as a company that was doubled down, du doubling down on oil exploration and stranded assets. And I entirely agree with you, Richard, on that. That's why folks picked ExxonMobil as a target. Uh, we see other companies. Uh, I'm going to mention one. You mentioned uh, core business and, and making transformation. There's a company in France that would be on that 200 list, by the way. Uh, they were several years back before it became proprietary, called Total SA. And Total has done um, a lot of work in reinventing itself. Now, I'm not going to pretend that they do not have carbon uh, fossil fuel re um, in interest in investments. They do, but they've done a number of things to um, to change its um, um, its position. And they are investing in um, in renewables. They're investing in uh, companies that um, that do renewables. There's a there's a, invest, a, a solar company in Vermont that has these cars that go by and it says on them, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, what do you call them? The, um, uh, boy, I'm trying to think of the term, the, uh, uh, the panels themselves. And it says panels are provided by uh, Sun Power. Well, Total SA owns over 60% of Total SA. Uh, so that, uh, that oil company has now made a ma major investment in solar. Uh, they, uh, when that company was having trouble, Sun Power back in 2012, uh, it, uh, when there was uh, uh, an issue with solar stocks tanking. So again, if I was to take a look at a, at a, um, a short investment um, parameter, I could say that solar stocks aren't going to cut it because look at what happened in either 2012 or 14. And by the way, Richard, I would say that 10 years um, is not a, a significant period of time to analyze an investment uh, uh, sector given that, as you said, that, um, that uh, uh, we're looking at horizons of 20, 30, 40 years. But Total um, um, gave them cheap financing in the tune of about a billion dollars. Uh, they were the first um, major fossil fuel company to acknowledge climate risk in 2006. They, had, they started doing some of their work in 2009 on, on uh, investments and things like Sun Power and others. Uh, they've committed to a shift in its uh, revenue base towards sustainable energy solutions. Uh, they, uh, uh, they exited the coal business in 2015. Uh, they uh, they uh, uh, reported that they reduced emissions over the last three years, a 20% aggregate decline in total on greenhouse um, gas emissions. Uh, emissions. And they, uh, as I said, they own a majority share in uh, uh, Sun Power. This is an example of a company that is making transitions. Now, are you going to ask if you're going to say that, um, you know, do you think the company's uh, perfect? No, I think it's a work in progress, but it is in progress. And there are companies such as Total that are making changes uh, to, di to diversify and invest in renewables. I hate to have to take them out of our portfolio and send a message that we don't care about that diversification by a, um, um, the hatchet approach that the um, S-251 would have. Um, so I think that we need to rethink that process and rethink the, um, the type of, um, of uh, bill that you want to produce. Uh, you mentioned earlier that, uh, that you, uh, uh, Ms. Madam Chair, that uh, it's very different than uh, uh, what New York has, and you are absolutely correct. New York's process is engage, 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 engage until you can't engage anymore. Uh, that is very different than the main approach was wipe these, uh, uh, these funds out of your portfolio 
And uh, I think that before you jump, you should do some research, make, the, make an informed choice. Uh, going back to uh, to the um, the package that I uh, presented to, I kind of I had to have some fun with this. So if you go to page 12 of the presentation, you see some reactions to the Exxon vote across the country. Uh, the Guardian, which is a um, um, a uh, paper that has clearly um, uh, um, sided with uh, the the uh, the issue of divestment. Um, uh, uh, said that the Exxon failed to defend its board against a coup uh, la launched by dissident hedge fund activist Engine Number no. One, um, and uh, there was a major transfer uh, transformation. Um, I saw another article uh, uh, that said big oil and gas had a no good, very bad day. It was a great day for the planet, and uh, I have a uh, a uh, uh, a tweet. I guess I never, um, never quite understood how you know Twitter and how that works. I still haven't uh, sent a tweet in my entire life, but this is from Bill McKibben, and it said, "Whoa, uh, yet more news on this watershed day." Over Exxon's strenuous objections, two directors calling for climate change have been elected to the company's board, and uh, actually, it ended up three with a close vote on the, on the third one. We also. You see sometimes, and you say, "What does that mean?" Uh, when you see um, that you've withdrawn a um, a, um, a, a shareholder resolution. You withdraw it when you've had success and when you've been able to negotiate with the company. And you see in our package that we had proposals um, with um, activism blizzard on pay, on pay parity, HESS on flaring reduction targets, uh, prosperity bank shares on inclusive recruitment policies. And we were able after successful negotiations to withdraw our, um, our uh, shareholder proposals. Uh, we worked uh, with an entertainment company. I'm just going to go through a few of these in terms of um, reporting on gender um, uh, and non-binary populations and, and uh, 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 pay um, equity. Uh, I worked with a um, group of 11 treasurers to engage a large real estate manager on its hotel management practices during the pandemic. And in that case, uh, we worked with the union, uh, Unite. 90% uh, of its, uh, its membership had been laid off uh, during the pandemic. And we were able to work to get uh, folks rehired. We were able to work to uh, change some of the practices. Now, I will grant you that those are not all, with the exception of Hess, Total, uh, um, Exxon that we've, uh, I've mentioned where we've had changes and we've had uh, successes. Um, we have an engagement practice with our managers as well. We're not just engaging with companies. What we're saying is that's talk to our investment managers, the people who invest our funds and make a game change there. We might have $100 million with ABC Investment Manager, but that manager is managing $100, million, uh, 100 billion of, um, of uh, dollars in, um, in, uh, under management with various institutional investors. By changing that company's approach, we make a difference, not just in Vermont's um, uh, tiny portfolio, but again, all the bears across the country and putting it together to make change. So we've done a process over the years to take a look at um, uh, how our managers do the work on climate change, what they have in terms of metrics, how do they approach climate change and other ESG activities. And you'll find on the VPIC website, a full report on the, um, on the, um, the actions of those investment managers in terms of um, uh, the steps integrating um, ESG policies into their investment process. And I, I would encourage you to, to take a look at that. I'm gonna take a quick look at some of the successes there in just a moment. Uh, the bottom line is that in 2017, when uh, PCA issued its report, it said that we would not be in a position to do divestment. However, there are ways to move forward and they gave us a number of recommendations. Uh, as treasurer and a member of VPIC, I took those recommendations and put together a five point plan, submitted it to VPIC, and it was ultimately adopted by the ESG committee and then the full VPIC. And we've had progress on all five of those. Um, I think I'm gonna be running close on time, so I won't go through all of them, but we've adapted, adopted a ESG policy and integrated that into our management su manager selection process. So we take a look at the, their ESG policies, including climate change, when we are hiring a manager. We continue to monitor that manager and performance and in, how it integrates that into risk. And we make decisions about our investments based on that, uh, that, um, uh, that policy. Uh, PCA uh, recommended exploring a, uh, um, and creating a new passive investment vehicle. 
we tried to work on that for, for a number of years. We uh, tried to partner with a large, uh, larger than us uh, city out west on the coast um, to, to do something. We were unable to get that done. So now we've invested $200 million in a, in a investment separate index fund developed for us by Rock, um, BlackRock that, um, that um, works toward a low carbon transition. Uh, and we're very thrilled that we were able to do that. That's 200 million, that's recent. We're looking to do more in that uh, area. And, uh, and we wanna see if we can combine our efforts with other institutional investors and, and, uh, and um, uh, get some um, value, not just for Vermont, but showing that that model works and getting that out to, uh, to other institutional uh, investors. Uh, the treasurer's office also was um, uh, uh, made a recommendation to explore ways to identify renewable energy opportunities as an asset class or a subset of asset classes. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, one of our um, of our uh, agriculture technology uh, investments, and this is a company that works um, in, um, in sustainable agriculture and, and creates infrastructure that uh, that supports it. That's a line of business. This isn't you know something that. Uh, it's on the side. This is what they do for a living. And uh, we've invested in that and are continuing to look for other opportunities. Uh, the other recommendation is that uh, we should look at uh, ways to, um, to do more metrics and th uh, with third party vendors. We've hired a, um, a uh, third party vendor, a matrix that allows us to, to take a deeper dive. And in, and in the process of doing our investment manager surveys and questionnaires, we're trying to work with those investment managers to get more metrics. Uh, we were working with the environmental community on that prior to the, um, the onset of COVID. And I think we're at a point now where we're going to be re-engaging with those folks. Uh, BPIC, uh, the fifth recommendation is to continue its dialogue with the investment managers on climate uh, change. And I think that we've been able to demonstrate uh, a great deal of success there. Um, all through this um, package, you'll see some of those successes uh, and a little bit of information on each one of those um, um, action plan uh, items. I'm going to bring us to a, to a page and I'll start on page 24. Beth, Beth I'm going to um, say that I have to leave in about two sure. minutes. Okay. And I don't know about other people, but um, so. Uh, I have yeah. to join you, so sadly. Okay. okay. Let me just uh, throw a couple of things in here. We have um, Artisan Partners, which is a global equity firm. And they have not had any exposure to fossil fuel energy corporations in its portfolio since 2019, something that we identified in our process of, of working with um, uh, the managers. I acknowledge that BlackRock does maintain positions in, some, uh, in oil and gas firms, including Exxon and Conoco. Uh, we do have a $200 million investment in a low carbon transition fund. And BlackRock has developed a series of ETF uh, funds aligned with the uh, 1.5 Celsius um, degree scenario. Um, we've um, uh, Blue Vista, which is a, a real estate firm that we have, is working now to, to incorporate lighting retrofits and lead certification, uh, if, even if I can't spell certification properly in the PowerPoint, uh, to, um, uh, as part of their underwriting process when they're looking at um, investment properties. Uh, Benefit Partners is a private equity firm. Uh, they, uh, they have now hired a consultant to perform an independent ESG analysis on investments and integrating that into their investment process. HarborVest, a private equity firm, um, scores all of their investments against an ESG template and they're developing an actionable climate change strategy in line with the recommendations. And this is important because we see this as the future in terms of metrics. The recommendations of the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, otherwise the TCDF. Um, and uh, they included that uh, information in their, their report. We are also looking at those for metrics in our system. Uh, quickly, um, uh, we have an, a private and alternative credit uh, company named the Aries. Uh, they've um, they've uh, been a supporter of the uh, TCFD, and uh, uh, they've uh, worked to uh, a lot to, to they're going to be preparing a report in the next quarter on their uh, their their aligned cl uh, climate change strategy uh, associated with uh, the TCFD initiatives. Um, Newberger Berman, if I can say that correctly, private equity firm, is a signatory to the Net Zero Asset Management Initiative, which has the goal of achieving net zero emissions in line with the Paris Agreement. Pontifex AgTech was the one I just mentioned that their key, their sector, their, their line of business is environmental 
environmental sustainability and climate change through investments um, in sustainable agriculture. Um, and uh, lastly, um, I would just point out that uh, in 2014, the treasurer uh, uh, presented and the retirement boards approved a fossil fuel free investment option uh, that was added to our deferred compensation and other retirement investment programs. Uh, and uh, uh, despite efforts to, to publicize that, we actually worked with a, a field organizer, organizer with uh, 350 at the time to try to get some interest in it. Uh, interest has been limited, but we're not giving up on that and we're gonna continue to, to work on that. Uh, in conclusion, VPIC is committed to ESG, addressing the issues of climate change. Um, I appreciate the work of 350.org and others uh, because they, they created awareness of the issues. And um, to me, that's very important, but there is no one cookie cutter approach and taking a look at the, the, all the tools that we have to, um, to approach climate change is important. When we play one off on the other, divestment versus engagement, uh, other practices, what we do is we, uh, we, we keep shooting at each other, frankly, and you give ALEC and other groups, conservative groups, the playing field because we're too busy um, uh, fighting among ourselves. That's not the way we should do things. We should work together in a collaborative way to find solutions. Uh, the goal, again, is to, um, to um, use a variety of strategies to move on these issues. Uh, we are interested, and by the way, we can make, make contact with you as well. We're always in contact with New York City, Calsters, and New York State. Um, and uh, Comptroller Dinopoli was one of my favorite people in working on the issues of climate change. Um, and uh, we would be happy to, 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 to work with those folks as well, and you, as we're trying to find solutions. Um, and we look forward to doing that, and we have a um, joint um, uh, uh, interest in, in dealing with this, we're, we're recommending very strongly that it be done with prudence and through a uh, thoughtful process of carbon reduction. And uh, again, we're, we're delighted that you folks are looking at it. What we wanna do is have a process that meets our fiduciary responsi uh, responsibilities, meets the, uh, the requirements for both what I refer to as procedural and substantive uh, prudence, just like what New York did. They did all those steps. It's time for us to take a look at those steps before we jump. And thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm, if people want to stay and ask questions, that's fine. I do have to leave. And what I'm going to suggest is that the, even the main sponsor of this bill seems to not agree with the bill as it's written right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to challenge the main sponsor of the bill to work with the treasurer and the and VPIC to come up with language that reflects this thoughtful process that we should be going through. I think that's good. I, 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 we had to get it in, as you know, by December 1st. And I think uh, after more thought, I think we would, and more yep. research, I think we would have maybe chosen something else, but okay. it, we are where we are. Yep. Regardless of how it came about, right. I'm going to, and if we want to do anything, we're going to have to do it um, the week we come back from town meeting, yeah. because yeah. that is um, that otherwise it won't go anywhere anyway. So um, I'm I'm Great. going to yep. put that in your can hands. I one, and, Senator White, can I ask one comment before you leave? Yes. Uh, you know, we've, I know the discussion with Richard Brooks was to bring in Makita or bring in somebody else to do studies. They cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. No, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm concerned that if we go that route, we don't have no. it in our budget that was submitted by the governor. I'm not suggesting any studies. I'm suggesting that you come up with a, a piece process. of legislation that would move us in the direction. And you've already had um, studies done. And that's, I'm not suggesting any studies that would cost money. No, you're suggesting we come up with- I'm suggesting that the people who introduced the bill should be working with the treasurer and with VPEC to come up with the language because apparently even the sponsors of the bill don't agree with the language as it is right now. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay. So Senator with Clark, that, we can be in touch we can talk to- Yes, let's do that and-, and Yes, and, and, that's- and the, You've got okay. a bunch of us here and Chris Pearson. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's do that. And I'm going to, with that, I'm going to jump.
I'm going to say yep. thank you to Beth to... and to Mr. Brooks, and um, I'll thank see you, you tomorrow because I'm you. now tw almost 20 minutes late for the my four o'clock. But somebody will catch us up. Thank you very yeah. much. This was great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. See you later. Bye. Well, Brian, it's just you and I. Just kidding, um, Senator Ryan. Yeah, I don't know where, to be, well, I don't know whether, do you have any questions, I senators? I'd be happy to answer. I'm I don't here. know whether where uh, Senator Ron Hinsdale went. I don't either. But anyway, you know, it just seems to me. I, mean, I don't have any questions really. I, I would just make an observation that it seems like with the work that's been done in places like New York, I mean, it should be able to give us a shortcut to moving in that direction. I mean- Well, the question with New York that I would have is, is, is it a policy discussion where we implement it as a BPIC policy or is it actual legislation? Because I- Yeah, I think no, that's a good question. I mean, I'm not sure of the answer to that either. Because New York sure seems to be more policy driven with internal right. internal decision-making and, and, and I'm happy to explore either. I just, I view legislation as, difficult to craft in the time frame you're looking at versus sure. working with policy and with Beth being chair of the ESG committee, uh, VPIC did um, refer the draft carbon policy to her subcommittee at VPIC to review further so that we're already working on that process. I just, I, I worry that legislation may just be a little bit too rushed in the one week time frame to get it just right versus looking at like a New York approach, which was, you know, work with their internal subcommittees to come up with something that we all can work with. So that, that's I, really more my I concern. Think, I think the, the bill itself was basically a conversation starter, yeah. which it has done, which is good, but now we're having the conversation. So that's making, that's progress, I guess. But that's well, I, what I the hope, bill was. I hope what's been mentioned here and, and understood is that Beth and I and VPIC over the past four or five years have done a tremendous amount of work in this area with only three staff people. So we, we've really right. tried to engage and we've really worked with PCA to come up with a plan. Now getting to the next level and seeing what worked and what didn't and, and how we can make it better. I view legislation as a way to say, you haven't been doing a good job or you haven't been working at it. And I think that's more of a last resort. And so I'm, I'm much more comfortable working with the ESG committee and figuring out what works and what doesn't and, and seeing where our successes were and, and trying to move forward that way. But I worry about legislation and the ancillary effects it could have on our indexing strategy and our private equity. And I'm more worried about that versus anything else. Because it was just a matter of selling the 150 million in stocks. Yeah, we could do it tomorrow. The question is, how do we then reinvest at a rate that's comparable? We're, we just got our performance reports uh, for the end of the year and we're in the top 10 percentile for fees in regards to how much we, get, we, we pay in fees for all of our funds. And, and that's in a one year, three year, five year, 10 year and 15 year period. We've made tremendous strides in, in benefiting taxpayers of the state of Vermont with our well thought out process. I would hate the fact that maybe 2% of the portfolio is exposed to some of the sector would, would, would jeopardize the rest of our 98%. That's my, my concern. Sure. Mr. Chair. Right. Mr. Chair, I, I'm back. Um, I apologize. I'm now I'm now sitting at Owen's um, uh, station because I managed to wreck both screens in my office. So they're black. I can't see you and I can't unmute. Other than that, it's perfect. I'm back. <laughs> we lost Couldn't tear yourself so away. <laughs> Richard, um, if you don't mind, can you just reflect on the question of whether New York did policy as opposed to legislation? I think it was being geared on policy, but can you give us an idea of what went on there? Yeah, so um, New York City and New York State are different. So New York City, um, the comptroller uh, is the um, you know is the custodian of the five pension funds um, in New York City. But each pension fund there has a board, um, which is a combination of uh, elected uh, union members, appointees uh, of the mayor, um, the comptroller, and the public advocate, uh, I believe. And there's different makeups depending on which board you're on. Um, but basically it came down to um, the mayor and the comptroller agreeing that they wanted to move ahead with divestment and then basically initiating conversations with the other trustees who then in a majority agreed to pass a policy uh, that would put in place a plan to divest those uh, pension funds. In the end, only three out of the five pension funds um, moved ahead with divestment. So the uh, Board of Education, the Teachers Retirement System, and the New York City um, 
employee retirement system. And the fire and police pension funds decided not to move ahead with um, divestment. So that was a policy passed by the individual pension boards at the behest of the comptroller. At the state level, um, a different structure is in place there for that for their pension fund. They have a single custodian, no pension board, and that's the state comptroller who's a single custodian. So he could decide tomorrow to divest or not divest. Um, I didn't realize that. So he makes yeah. he's he's a singular decision maker. He's a singular decision maker. Obviously, he, he takes the advice of his staff very seriously. They have outside advisors, consultants, etc. Um, there was legislation that was proposed um, and was actually moving quite far ahead. It had a number, had a majority of uh, sponsors on board, both in the state senate and in the assembly, and it was going to come down to a vote, uh, likely at the beginning of 2021. And the comptroller. Uh, decided to move on um, his decarbonization and um, de-risking and divestment plan ahead of that legislation coming to a vote. So I think the legislation in that case was, um, you know, uh, a, a good engagement tool and was very much focused on educating the public and uh, decision makers around this. But in the end, the state controller passed a policy and put in place a climate action plan, as he calls it, uh, that is systematically reviewing uh, all of their fossil fuel holdings, kind of subsector by subsector, assessing them against uh, certain risk criteria. So, are they is their capex spending in line with the direction of um, alignment with the Paris Climate Agreement? Uh, uh, do they have real transition plans in place? Are they going to, you know, are they going to achieve net zero uh, emissions? Do they have emissions reductions in place? What's the, uh, what is, what kind of reporting do they do? So a whole series of factors, evaluating each company based on those, and then divesting from those who uh, he deems to be too risky, um, too financially risky to the fund. So a very systematic approach, but it's also time limited. So he said, we have four years to do this. We're not going to engage with these companies uh, for an infinite amount of time. We basically, when we start a review six months later, if we don't get the right responses and don't have the right plans from these companies, then we're out of these companies. And so he's gone through coal, uh, oil sands companies, just completed shale oil and gas, and now is moving on to the biggest review, which is their integrated oil and, oil and gas majors, which includes Exxon and Chevron, those companies. So it seems to me, I'm just going to say one more thing that I'm going to let us go because we've all been here sitting here a long time, not just for this discussion, but we went through a whole pension discussion as well earlier this this afternoon. So, but it reminds me back when Senator, Senator, when Treasurer Pierce was talking about a company who I can't remember the name, but the one in France, I believe, that was doing good stuff and had invested in the renewables and whatnot. You would, you would not have to divest necessarily from that company because that company was making efforts to become net zero producer of carbon. So I think there would be criteria that would allow you to continue to invest in that company if they were moving in the right direction. That's my understanding anyway. So I think, is that the case? Well, Senator, Senator Polino, I believe when I looked at the, uh, the current bill uh, and following the main model, it would still be on that 200 list. Um, it was 11th or 12th on the list years ago. Yeah, but and, a policy uh, would allow us position. to screen that out based on our criteria that we set up. So yeah, right. It, it I think that we, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I just think the bill is not on the table at this point. You know, to talk That's about the hear. bill doing this, doing that. The bill is the way to start this conversation. It's <laughs> certainly not to be all and end all of the strategy of planning for divestment. So yeah. I appreciate that, and I, I'm glad to hear that, and I'm looking forward to engaging with you and and Richard. I hope that you can be part of the conversation as well. Uh, I know that um, uh, a lot of the environmental groups in in the state are continuing to have dialogues with us, and we bring them in. I, we all have the same goal. Um, I'm uh, uh, I've been uh, an advocate of environmental reform. I was a a um, a vocal supporter of the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, and uh, I continue to, to have that commitment. I think that I'll, members of VPIC have that commitment. I know the folks on the ESG committee do. We need to find ways to work together and find a solution. And thank you, uh, Senator P Polina, so, for putting this on the table so that we can have that conversation. Appreciate it. Appreciate your willingness to engage just in terms of the climate change um, 
indication it started to rain outside my window as we're having this conversation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you all for taking the time. Richard, thank you for taking the time and making yourself available to us. We'll definitely be in touch. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, follow up. I'll drop an email um, to uh, Gail uh, with some follow up materials. Um, that yeah, and then she'll distribute them. it to us. Yeah, and uh, just one, just one last point I'll just make is just um, whatever process that you decide to move forward with is uh, to ensure that you have the right level of staff resources to be able to implement that process. Part of sure. the reason why New York City went the way they did, which is clear divestment. They set criteria, identify fossil fuel companies, got their advice, and then move forward with divestment is because they didn't have the amount of staff that the New York State Pension Fund has to be able to systematically review and engage with all these companies. And I know that VPEC is small staff and you've done a lot already. So um, that is a that should be a consideration for you as well. If, if you are not able to do a review of hundred, several hundred companies, like the New York State uh, model, then you may want to look to something that's more simple and clear cut, uh, which could be uh, more along the lines of pure divestment, smaller number of criteria, um, and um, that might be uh, easier and more effective and, and probably cheaper um, than taking the New York State approach. So okay. Richard, if I could comment on that, if it's okay, Senator, which is sure. that uh, we don't want to take the uh, the easy way out because we don't have the staff. We have our associations with a number of groups, uh, climate action groups, and uh, and those resources. Yes, we uh, were short staff, uh, short short staff, and we could not, for instance, do what New York does, which is build their own um, index fund internally. Uh, we don't have the capability of doing that. But I think that uh, we would never want to uh, have a a a, a, a short outlook on this because we don't have the staff to do it. We have to find a way to make it right, uh, even if we're short-handed. And uh, well, Tom will say this is a great opportunity to ask for more staff at the legislature. But, well, exactly. Uh, exactly. We may need more <laughs> there staff. You go. I think we well, may he need doesn't like legislation. <laughs> well, <laughs> but the budget is the budget. And if you're asking us to do more things with the monies that we have, and it's it's a difference between going to Wall Street and paying them 60 basis points versus asking for 300 grand more, um, I'd rather ask for the 300 grand more, you know, from the legislature. Sure. So it, it's, you. it's, you know, we'll, we'll have to explore whatever comes about from our, what, how that would impact staff and whether Eric will meet a couple people or, or not. And, and we'll make that decision at that point. The budget's Fair already enough. in the legislature for this year. So we don't have, we don't have time really to change it now, right. but, but next year, you know, as we go through this process, <laughs> we may come back to you next, you know, December, uh, this is what we'll need to really do this right. And is this where the right direction that you want to go into? Well, that's fair enough. Appreciate yeah. it. All right. Thank you all. And we'll be Thank in you. touch. Take Thank care. Don't get rained on. Okay. Bye-bye.